let's see which camera works. Ah, there you go. Works. Very Ruben, fine. go get in here. <laughs> We're joined by the one and only Ruben. What's your What's your last name? Waterman. Waterman. Uh, and you have water, man. <laughs> <laughs> Never heard that before. Terrible. Never. Puns. <laughs> Minus five points for Gryffindor. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how do you like the conference so far? It's great. It's so nice to see so many people together and everyone is working on lightning stuff. Um also before just before the conference every team was like pushing stuff like oh we need to get it done before the lightning conference. <laughs> yeah. It's great. It's awesome. All kinds of new stuff. I saw all the uh I like the little gadgets, a little picture thing printed out my picture and then another thing shot bubbles out into the air and all the little lightning Did you try out the lightning ATM? The one no. that you throw in coins and you get Satoshi. Did, did Ben get it working or is there a different one? No, there's, there's a different one. There's several. Nice. Yeah. No, I love the idea with the coins because especially around here, there's all these coins I keep getting from country, 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 and I don't really want them. So mm. I would love it if there was a machine, a commercial level at an airport, just stack it in there, yeah. dump the things in there, put it on my wallet, and I'll go. So for a while, and unfortunately it's gone, but like for a while there was a Bitcoin ATM in Amsterdam airport. Mm -hmm. And that yeah, was great nice. because like, like for me, it doesn't really matter if I have some extra euros, mm -hmm. but I would love the opposite when I go to the US. Yeah, and yeah. just before I go out of the country, I'm like, yeah, yeah, okay, here's 20 bucks in my pocket. Probably won't use it until a while. And then I just get Satoshis for it. Yeah, I definitely read about that ATM when it came out. We were all very excited. And then I think I read about it when it closed and we were all sad. Uh, but it's funny when you walk around the Las Vegas airport, where I'm from right now, uh, there's all these signs kind of basically threatening the Canadians. And the signs are like, attention, Canadians, did you win money? Make sure you report it. Like there's all these things. And if there was one of those machines there in the airport, you know, if you want to allegedly as a Canadian or anyone else, you can just put your money in there. It would become Bitcoin. And did you win it? Do you even have it? Like, is it even or yours? It? I mean, Who you have knows? access to a private key. Is that the same as owning a thing? Like, no one knows right now. Yeah. So it would be a good idea. Nice, nice use case. For the Canadians. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but what I do at the border is just change uh, shit coins for diesel. Uh, and oh, that helps. Yeah, yeah. That's a very liquid, very fungible, very, <laughs> very divisible uh, medium of exchange. And they take all the coins, they take all the change, they're used to it. They're like, exactly. of course you have to buy gas. Like, yeah. you need this. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, yeah. you need to buy the gas for exactly 512 check crowns. Exactly. And, but it's, it's very risky because, right, if, you, if you're like fiddling with, with the gas pump uh, and it hits like, you have exactly 512 cr uh, crowns, but it, held, it hits 513, yeah, then you're you, fucked. I mean, you cannot even pay by cards. Yeah. Like you don't, you don't have cards anymore, no, right? No, that's the thing. Like for me, it's cash. And you know, that, uh, you got to get some kind of a backup pay as you go card or some kind of thing. I mean, oh, you just need the option. I like, would be boring. Uh, no, I, <laughs> I, have, I have a big enough problem now with not having cash. And I go to all these places where i'm like i want this this and this and they're like card and they're like no sir cash only i'm like oh, yeah. I, I don't have anything because yeah they here in in berlin i like it like i whenever i am in the eurozone mm -hmm. i try to only use cash yeah yeah um you should do that everywhere yeah but i just <laughs> i can't be bothered with keeping the spare change if i like if i go to romania for a week and then i have some lay left at the end and i'm I don't have a car to put diesel in. <laughs> <laughs> and buy a bunch of beer. Yeah. <laughs> the, other, the other trick there is that you have to get rid of it before you leave the country. Like yeah. if you had the lay and you went to the next country, nobody wants the lay anymore. You yeah. got to get rid of it in that airport. And at mm -hmm. first I didn't know this. And then, yeah, I would have tons of like currency following me that I didn't want. I still have a bunch of Asian coins, like from different countries, and I was always like, "Nah, I get ripped off at the airport on the exchange." Rate. Yeah, but now yeah. I'm even more ripped off because no, that, that cash is like never. You're holding it again. forever, <laughs> and yeah, the price is going down. Yeah, I remember we went to Prague or whatever it was for HCPP, and like I was watching the currency rate, and I was like, "I'm losing my shirt in this. Like my beer money is getting destroyed here." Like, yeah. yeah. But the good thing is when you're in other countries, the prices are denominated in the shit coins, right? <laughs> and hopefully they don't push up the prices in the time that you're there. Uh, so that's done a lot of the math where sometimes you'll be buying like a pack of gum or something. I'll be like, that would probably be a dollar in the States. But if it's half and if it's a 75, that's 75 cents. That's cheaper, like significantly <laughs> cheaper. And I thought we had the best supply lines in the world, the cheapest shit. And the cheapest people even. But uh, no, there's some like cheaper stuff out here, especially like you're saying, Romania. 
I was getting like my normal breakfast of like some bread, bananas, like a soda and like a, a Danish or something like all this stuff, usually 10 bucks in the US. Romania, two dollars and eighty four cents. But like, supermarkets in the US are super expensive. Like, apparently like so. in here in Germany, I think it's as cheap as possible, but like And it's actual yeah. food too. <laughs> my my friends are telling me they're like, Yeah, you really should eat at McDonald's in Germany because we won't let them put all that shit in the food. Like it's not as bad as American McDonald's, which is full of preservatives and things. Like it's a slightly better version of McDonald's. It's still <laughs> well, still though, I mean, imagine what we're eating in America. Like it's really bad, and it's the things like you can't trust the bread from the grocery store. You can't trust the vegetables. Like you have to buy, pay more for organic things all the time if you really want to be serious about it. And most people aren't. Most people can't spend that much money on their food or don't want to, even though. It's pretty important. Like it's the stuff you're putting inside you. I mean, you get all this like, oh, I got to save money on this and save money on that. And then you're eating plastic lettuce and you're like this lettuce is made of plastic. And it's like, no, no, you should eat real lettuce. Like it's tough to convince people. But yeah, it's one of the things you should spend money on. So. Well, and another thing that you should spend money on is Bitcoin. Uh, so stacking uh, yeah. sets is very, very important. Why is stacking sets important, Ruben? Uh, why is that important? I don't because know. you want to have the soundest money ever instead of <laughs> shit coins. You don't want to have. You don't want to save euros. Like they'll only become worth less. Whereas, odds are pretty high that the orange coin will go up. Number so go it's up. Uh, yeah, number go up. So I think people should allocate more and more savings into Bitcoin compared yeah. to uh, euros. Yeah, exactly. And Thomas, what have we been saying on the WCN forever? I'm going to take this chance again to present you, Ruben, with the amazing Ein Billion Mark note. That's Ooh. right. This is 1,000 million. So you are now a billionaire. Wow. There you go. We've, we've, we've invested in your company. We invested in your it. company. Yeah. We just <laughs> bought all your shares. Uh, that's it. You're done. You work for us now. And uh, you can buy an egg or maybe a loaf of bread, maybe a piece of bread. So maybe Satoshi is not the first trillionaire because uh, when this was used, there were trillionaires. Yeah, sure. you just had to have 10 of these. I had uh, at least 50 of these when I started. I've been giving them out, so I've actually been losing value. Um, but yeah, I mean, <laughs> there's a, quite a time. You could get a wheelbarrow full of these. You could heat your house. A lot of people use them for wallpaper. Uh, they have a lot of value, these marks. Yeah, much so utility. Such, such utility. Everyone forgets. It's only a... It's but they're real, a, right? Yeah, yeah, totally real. Serial number is real. Whole thing's real. They the, still accept they're still legal tender. That uh, so stamp, the buy Bitcoin stamp, that's actually from the period. That's circa 1920. <laughs> uh, they were incredibly prescient there. They, yeah. they had it going on, the Germans. Yeah. Yeah. So it was actually Satoshi doing the money printing back then also. Oh. Um, that's how he came up with the idea. Like, oh, exactly. It was Zatoshi then back then. It wasn't the S, it was Z. So, yeah. So, yeah, Thomas, dollar cost averaging, right? That's the, that's the thing See, to do. Now, I like dollar cost averaging. I know everybody's into these trendy terms and they're all stacking sets. And, and again, to me, a little voice in my back of my head's like, why didn't you listen to mad bitcoins? I told you to buy real bitcoins. Like, you don't have to be stacking sets if you listen to me. Like, if you've been in this for a few years, you could have stacked bitcoins. Like, where were all you people now? You're stacking sets. And if you're dollar cost averaging, which is, again, a it's more complex idea than this. The stacking sats is not as cool as dollar cost averaging. Like that's it's a long work too. Like it is, it is, it is. DCA, DCA, you know, it's all right. And it, it doesn't like translate in like at least in my native language, Dutch, there's not really a nice way to say dollar cost averaging. Like it gets like a really ugly Costing, translation. Costington, Averagington, <laughs> all one giant word. TL, TL, TF. Yeah, all Is there in German? Um Euro cost. Euro cost and Schmidt. <laughs> all right so maybe it's not the most thing but the idea of buying a hundred dollars a month is really what you want to do something that you don't have to worry about you don't have to watch it you don't have to look at it you don't have to know the price of bitcoin lots of people are like investing more money than they can lose and they're like oh i put it all in and then it went down or i put it all in and it went up and either way you're that's the off. worst when people put it all in and they see it go down and then they get scared and they sell. And that's like when you actually take the loss. Whereas like if you're just patient, which like if what you're saying, like people are investing too much, mm -hmm. they can be patient, right? Because they invested too much. They yep. actually needed the cash flow for something well, and It's else. important to have a job and to keep your job. And I always tell people to keep their jobs. Like I've 
never left my job on purpose. It's always been an unfortunate occurrence. <laughs> um, but uh, no, yeah, I like having a job. It's great to have healthcare and all these kind of things. So, so, so how does bitter help stack sat? Well, so with bitter, at least if you live in Europe, it's really easy it? to to stack sets. So. Uh, basically, you sign up on the website with your email address, phone number. You give us one of your Bitcoin address or if you're more advanced than XPUB. And then you set up the bank transfer. You go to your bank, you tell them, hey, I want to send 25 euros a week to Bitter. Put in your own like little deposit code that I know that, it, it, that this is your money and it should go to this Bitcoin address. And then you're good to go. And that's, that's it. it. That's, that's it. it. So you provide the XPUB, right? Then you always, you generate a new receiving address for the Bitcoin. And then every time you make like one of these SEPA of like recurring payments, like you, you set up uh, every Monday sends 20 bucks worth uh, or 25 bucks worth. I think that's the minimum um, to the, uh, to the, to the bitter SEPA bank account. Yeah. Uh, and then how fast uh, does that get transferred to Bitcoin for the user? So it depends on the bank that the money is coming from, how fast they get it to us. Yeah. So with most banks in Europe, it's uh, the next business day. So let's say you do a transfer on Friday, the money will arrive to us on Monday. And then we check our bank uh, once per hour to see for any new transactions. The computers don't work on the weekend. Uh, <laughs> at the, at not the banks. On, not on Sundays. The not banks, the no bank's computers, they're well, very lazy. Honestly, there's like now more and more banks added into this instant SEPA scheme. And that makes it really nice. So, for example, I have some German customers that use uh, Sparkasse or something like this. And so even like that money arrives actually in like a few <laughs> seconds into our bank account. So they get their Bitcoin like next, like within one hour. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, awesome. We'd also like to announce that the World Crypto Network has just invested 1 billion marks into Voltoro as yeah, well. We right have just on. acquired Bitter and Voltoro. 100% uh, of all the A mirror the price of 2 billion marks uh, for <laughs> yeah. the two companies. Uh, we're feeling very satisfied today. Is this Rostmark or West a Reichsmark? That's probably World War I, uh, yeah, pre-World War I, post-World War I money. I wonder if they had anything printed on the back back then. I imagine they did. One These are more like a notebook that I got at the thing, but yeah. it's a nice example of inflation and inflation money and people that have forgotten all about the, the Deutschmarks and all the things. You just show them this and you're like, why would they print a note this big? Don't fuck up the Because money. of inflation. Like it wasn't to buy, like they weren't going to do the Louisiana purchase. So they made 12 <laughs> special billion dollar notes to, you know, give to Napoleon. No, no, no. These were for normal purchases. <laughs> I mean, what's interesting, after World War I, you know, we had uh, in Germany here a massive inf uh, inflation. Why? Because they, well, they had to print themselves out of debt. Uh, well, the reparations that they owed for the, rest, for the other countries were so huge. Indeed. But France and stuff, they actually asked for gold in return for these, in these reparations. And, and, and that was fine. So what, what actually Germany did was print their own money and buy gold with that and then pay that. And uh, that, of course, drove up the gold price like crazy um, because they knew there was all this demand. And then they started banning gold uh, imports of the head. I mean, there was all sorts of fiddly f ways to try to pay these reparations for free, basically, by just printing this stuff. And it looks so obvious in hindsight that the reparations would lead to the next war. Uh, yeah. I don't know if they thought about that in the time, but a lot of historians are pretty much now getting rid of this idea of World War I and World War II and just tying it together. It because really there is. was a really, there's a period of non-hostilities and then just kicks off again. So yeah. there it yeah, is. Yeah, there, there was a lot of hostility of, uh, you know, especially of creep from the other countries saying, you know, these scum and kicking to the ground, taking, taking property from the Germans to, because, you know, you still owe us from the world. And eventually, what are you going to do? I mean, I can imagine every country just being peed uh, off. And, and eventually, they, they vote for some hardcore nut job who's like, we are German. I even get really proud. He sure it is. And, uh, and we're seeing that globally now. It's a dangerous trend, this sort of hardcore nationalism uh, that's it's happening. Desperate people. They don't know what yeah. else to do. And, and you see, every time there was a period of hyperinflation, um, soon after, there was a drastic period of hardcore communism, hardcore fascism, Get or it. just tyranny in general. And we've seen the biggest hyperinflation on a global scale ever over the last couple, 10, 20 years. Yeah. 
And it's going to be interesting what's to come next. Yeah, I mean, when you see uh, news of the New York Fed printing another $128 billion and no one blinks an eye, and no one really, it's not even covered really. The only people that cover it are like hardcore, you know, asset rare number types like ourselves or rare metal types that, that are like, uh, how much did you print? Where? Like, <laughs> no one's talking about this stuff. I mean, you know, 128 billion. I think, I think that's, that's like the number of that's 120. That's 128 of these things. Of those, right? That's it. just fucking printed. That's, yeah. that's almost as many crazy. as I bought. I bought at least 50 <laughs> yeah. of those, so I could only buy half or a third of, of what they print. It, yeah. It's amazing, and so you know, I, I, it's funny because what generally then happens is that the uneducated types start blaming oil companies or milk producers or bread <laughs> bakeries for being greedy capitalists because they're charging so much for bread. Unknowingly, they're not really doing any of that. They're just keeping up with inflation. And that's the sad thing that the private sector gets the blame for, for hiking prices. Um, property prices is also a big one. Bitcoin fixes this. Yeah, well, it's big, interesting, big Josh, you mentioned the, the attitude towards the German people. One of the books I picked up at the museum recently is called A Pocket Guide to Germany. And it's this little green book that they gave to every American GI who came over here after World War II for the occupation. And it's really interesting uh, because a lot of it is like crazy wrong stuff. And they're talking, they're like, you know, the German has surrendered, but do not accept their surrender. They are still crafty, blah, 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 blah. And then the rest of it's like, be nice to them. These are our friends. They're not our allies yet, but they're our friends and we want you to be nice. And then there's like a phrase book and there's like different words to use and like just hints and tips. And uh, I, I, you know, barely heard of it. You have to assume they did something. It gives people information. But so, so shall we print like the, the, the five step guide to, to the shitcoiners? Like these are or, or like Bitcoin, like if you're, if you're one. coming into the Bitcoin world and you yeah. need to understand and you get this little pocket guidebook yeah. and like they've done that little Bitcoin book, but even it, it's not little. Like oh. there's this c complete denial of like the level that we need to reach for people. And they're like, oh, you know, safety and this Bitcoin standards, greatest book ever. I try to read it. It has like paper thin, like Bible pages. You can see through to the text on the other side. And there's tons and tons of words. It's like an economics textbook. And I'm sure it's fine, but it's not like beginner's guide to Bitcoin. Like I am dumb, help me. And then the same thing, this little Bitcoin book. It's cool. It looks like it's a bunch of essays, but again, it seems very academic level. Uh, there is that, uh, what's his name? Bitcoin rabbi Bitcoin did rabbi. like a B for Bitcoin. That one Bitcoin. Is awesome. That one sounds good. That sounds like that's where we need to start from. And if we honestly, had a teenager like, version of that or a young adult version, I mean, like, oh, no, but like really low, it, right? Like it, the illustrations and stuff, it looks like it's for like really young kids. But I think that you would have to be at least at the end of primary school. So maybe like 12 or so, because it's not super easy. You know, this is the whole beauty of LE5, you know. Uh, yeah, Explain yeah. Explain oh. it to me like I'm five. There's a lot of people, you know, in their mid 30s, 40s, 50s who are like, thank God for these LE fives. You know, it's they're, they're they're really beautiful because it makes you get rid of all the techno babble and and try to reduce stuff down to understand. Well, imagine there was a bird, and you know. <laughs> well, and it's it's really difficult to do this. I mean, Richard Feynman talks about this all the time that taking a complex scientific thing and breaking it down improves your understanding of it for you trying to teach it. And I know I've tried to make like intro to Bitcoin videos and I start off really simple and I branch, I have to explain this and this and this and this and this. And then I'm like, it's not simple anymore. And then you try to make the language all perfect and the presentation all perfect. And I just perfect myself out of it and I couldn't do it, but I'm still supposed to do it. And it's still supposed to be a thing because yeah, people keep making them, but we haven't hit whatever it is, the right number of words or the, simple explanation like well, try to mimic the, uh, the the book that you just picked up from the museum yeah yeah i don't know i'll try it. i'll look at it and especially i, I like the i think you're right because yeah the phrases section like words that bitcoiners use like blockchain or coinbase or a block or any of these things all have other meanings and it's yeah, pretty hodl. much like yeah hodl it's like a foreign language like you're you're entering into bitcoin country and and Ansel Lindner yeah. from the Bitcoin and Markets podcast on, the, on his resource page, like bitcoinandmarkets.com or something, 
Uh, he also has like the vocabulary, some familiar phrases. He has a bunch of resource links. Um, you know, we have a bunch of these resource pages, like lob.net, of course. Uh, well, that's way to too much. Like if, all if you're welcoming somebody new oh, yeah. to to the space, you yeah. don't want to send. I mean, yeah. it, really, it really is. is yeah. It's amazing. Like yeah. I go there sometimes. Yeah. But like you don't want to. That's too much. Um, they're DG's uh, 21 lessons. Uh, that is that is like my go-to uh, introductionary piece because uh, okay. that really covers a lot of the like from zero to well, 21. Uh, nice. It's pretty good. And it's, it's a tough place to be because I remember encrypting email in like 2003 and I wrote a great little step-by-step -step guide and had a cartoon at the top and I told all my friends, I'm like, you want to email me, you know, download Thunderbird, <laughs> install PGP extension, get a key. Well, it was like 12 steps. I thought it was really reasonable. And uh, no one ever emailed me again. There's like a huge cliff, like the drop off. Perfect. That's a like, great and, way. And, and that's like, fine too. Bug. That's also fine. Like I'm totally a success. But we just don't want Bitcoin to be the same way. Like this incredible technology yeah. does all this stuff, but we use it. Five other guys use it. The 300 people here use it and no one else. Like, no, that's, that's, that's a really good point. And I, yeah. you know, as much as I hate Facebook and WhatsApp and all this nonsense, yeah, I got to give kudos where kudos is due. And the fact that, that WhatsApp turned on end-to-end -end encryption, supposedly. It's not so very, far, it's not so good. Fair, but, but they brought the idea to the mass public. Where they did. Well, overnight, remember, okay. overnight yeah. it was like millions and millions of people yeah. were suddenly seeing a little message saying, end-to-end -end encryption, here's your key. And they'd sort of look at it and go, oh, what's that? So just the idea is there. And now I've got a lot of people saying, oh, well, what? Telegram isn't quite secure enough. You know, like the, this sort of conversation with a normal person would never have happened. And I think, you know, the, the you need these crises like uh, Cambridge Analytica and mm -hmm. stuff to, to hit so that the mainstream goes, oh, you know, they don't need, you know, someone like Alex Jones screaming at them, telling them the government's tra tracking everything. They, they actually see it in the mainstream news saying, oh, wow, you know. Uh, we need to do something about this and then uh, investing a little bit of time educating themselves it's like sun tzu said if your opponent is you know all moving around and stuff just sit there and let him destroy himself and one of the things we've seen here i think it was wasim mentioned it, he said that thanks for the yahoo engineers and it turns out that you know everyone always talks about how oh they're going to look in your files and they're going to read your facebook well apparently the yahoo engineers actually were breaking into people's e allegedly breaking into people's emails and reading and looking at the naughty pictures and all this kind of thing. And now we have this great example where we say, if you have too much power, your engineers and Facebook did it too. They searched for like celebrities and Tom Cruise and all this kind of thing, too much power. They're going to use it. They're going to, you know, look at your files. So it's better to have it encrypted and we can do that. Oh, is it's this the battery solution that they're going with? Yeah. Sounds very dangerous. It's almost like uh, like having the power of printing money. Like if you have that power, you're going to abuse it. Maybe not right now, maybe not today, but at some point you will. And you also want to keep it like a monopoly. It's like the one ring. It's like you can't be giving it up to anyone else. It's like you're precious. So. Yeah, we, this, is, this is something that really, when, when, I've forgotten who the quote even comes from, but power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. I, it's such a classic statement. Yeah. And yeah. it's so pungent in its, in its preciseness that it, it, it's really important never to forget that. Uh, whether, whether it's a private company or a government, it, it, if you give one entity too much power, they're going to use it uh, eventually against you. Like there, there's it, a lot of people, especially on the left, I would say generally, because they seem to be very trusting. They're like, oh no, we need to you know, ban this and ban and give more control. And because the person that's in control at that time, it, I'm talking about government here, is, is trusted. Like, like, you know, let's say they give great speeches, like Obama was a very charismatic, great talker, but, and uh, everyone was willing to hand over all this power, then Trump comes in and, and can take that. Or, or, you know, if you don't, if you don't believe that Trump's bad, someone else could come in, you know, and, and be even worse. So you really want to be always pull back power, for whether it's from companies, in, in, and that's what the decentralization stuff is all about, is to say, hey, we don't want to, or the, or the migration of data, at least, you know. Well, the, the other half of that is to think of Voltaire and what he said about the philosopher king, yeah. or maybe Rousseau. But, um, and sorry he talks about how I gotta, gotta go. go. I gotta go. All yeah. right. Oh, well, sorry, guys. Gone. Getting back to work. Yeah. Check out, check out Voltoro. Check out the live stream. Don't forget your sweater. 
And if you spill that thing, I'm going to kill you. So uh -huh. take it away. Uh -huh. Corbel spill machines. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. You, sur you survived today. You're very lucky. Uh -huh. Thanks, Josh. Uh -huh. We'll see you see later, ya. man. But yeah, he talked so, about the philosopher king and that what we really need is a king that doesn't want to be king. And that's almost impossible, right? Because everyone wants to be king. You get all the power, you get to print all the money, all that kind of thing. Yeah. So, yeah. but no one, you know, the person who should rule is the one who doesn't want to rule. And people like Trump really like to rule. So it's a very bad, bad, bad thing. Yep. So that's why we rule only our Bitcoin full nodes. That's and not it. Much else. It's better running a Bitcoin full node. Of course. Very good. How else would we be able to pay people? Yeah. In Bitcoin. Well, no, actually, <laughs> the payer doesn't need to do any verification. Only the receiver does. So the question yeah. is, how do you get the Bitcoin that you then sell to your peers? Yeah. Well, so we well we buy them on Kraken, so then that's we can really validate that Kraken really send us Bitcoin. Exactly. Exactly. That's it. Yeah. Perfect. Very good. Very important. Actually, so, I mean, the uh, Bitter started, like, the MVP was just, like, with address reuse, right? You yes. put in one address. And yes, because I wanted to keep the user onboarding, like, super simple. Yeah, like, uh, yeah it was a good MVP. Right? But, of course, bad for privacy. Right? Yeah. And then you implemented XPUBs, which yeah. is fantastic. And that works. You send in public keys, new address every time. Nobody on the chain knows that all these addresses are correlated, that they all come to the same user. And so we still know the same as we did before when addresses were reused. So, like, there's, not, there's no privacy enhancement on that end, but, mm -hmm. like, that's impossible to achieve. Like, yeah. you're, you're buying the Bitcoin with, like, a, 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 an exchange. Yeah. So, like, uh, yeah, the exchange can see what you do with the Bitcoin. Yeah, but nobody else can. That's a good yeah. thing. Yeah. Um, and then, though, uh, also now what you've probably announced already, I'm not sure, but you're doing some magic with Lightning. Oh, yes. So that was uh, yesterday. It, Did you announce it? Yeah, yeah. Fantastic. Um, I should probably send out a tweet about this, this uh, proof of concept. Uh, yeah. But the, uh, the idea is that for small amounts, uh, instead of doing these transactions all on-chain, we would try to send them over Lightning. Mm -hmm. but you know lightning is still early days so we also implemented it in such a way that if the lightning payment fails we're we're good, just gonna send it on chain like we we still don't want to be custodial yeah. Um, yeah very good right yeah you're not custodial as soon as you get the money like the fiat uh shit coins you send out the money the Bitcoin. yeah yep oh, perfect um so yeah how are you thinking about the lightning integration uh so it, it's it's early and it's kind of difficult to see where everyone else is moving yeah. um so in our proof of concept that we demoed yesterday we were using spontaneous payments and the way we did it is that on your first transaction that you're trying to do over lightning we will open a channel to you uh, to your node um put in like four times the amount of that particular transaction. Maybe we'll put even a little bit extra because, you know, because of ex um, the rate fluctuations, we might not be able to make the last payments just on a few cents, which is, that's nasty if you want to, if you, for that reason, have to close and open a new channel. Mm. And so then that's only one on-chain transaction. And then we can push like four more payments, well, three more payments into the uh, channel to the other side. Yeah, so, so basically it's transaction batching, right? In a sense, you, you have one on-chain transaction to, to open the Lightning channel, yeah. and then you can make three, four, uh, even more uh, Lightning transactions, right? Every next week on Monday when the user buys. Yeah. Uh, and then ultimately, eventually you close the channel, and you only have two on-chain transactions, opening and closing. But you can do off-chain three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah, so that's not... That's how it works right now because of that dependency on spontaneous payments. Mm -hmm. What I would hope to achieve in the future is that just people um, have like maybe a few inbound capacity channels with LNBIC or some other of these service providers. And we just have a few big channels that we use for all our customers instead of having to open channel per customer. Mm -hmm. Because there, like there are other companies in the space that are like the, these kind of liquidity providers and they're in the channel business. Yeah. We don't really want to go that route. Oh, really? Why not? Um, well, because of the liquidity, that's an issue. Like I, I did a small calculation that if every bidder user would use um, 
Lightning today, I would have uh, six Bitcoin locked up in channels. And that's too much. Yeah. So I'd rather have like maybe one channel with one Bitcoin in it that I use for every customer. And then when it runs out, I just open a new one on my own node. Um, that's just a lot more scalable. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Hmm. Yes. Well, I mean, but on the other hand, oh no, right, right. Okay, no, okay, no. Because I'm thinking, ultimately, you sent the same amount of Bitcoin. But if you open a channel to every user, you want to have like four times the payment, right, in channel size. So yes. yeah, right. That actually does require more capital. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but on the other hand, you could earn something, right, by by just providing a, a good routing node. Yeah, I was just thinking today that I could still offer this service, but like on my website, so that it's not part of the you know recurring payments thing, mm -hmm. um, but more like, hey, I'm gonna buy Bitcoin now using some other method than uh, SEPA because it does have to be instant. And then um, you know there could be a selector uh, field where you ask for other like additional inbound liquidity yeah. on top of your payment. Yeah. That could be Something like this. Yeah, I mean that's uh, that's a bit similar to what uh, Zap Olympus is doing, right? Uh, I mean they were first like a Lightning Wallet, of course, and more a service like liquidity serv or Lightning Network service provider, and now also the fiat on ramp. Yeah. Right? Um, so in that sense, uh, similar similar model. Yeah. So uh, obviously, Bitter does not have a wallet. So, but I could see a future where like other wallet creators would want to integrate such a service into their wallet, mm -hmm. but they don't want to deal with the whole fiat thing. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That, again, that's a collaboration between the project. Wallet mm -hmm. developers are good at writing wallet development code. Exactly. And, and you have your expertise with, I, with onboarding from fiat. I really would not want to build another Lightning wallet. <laughs> like there's, just, yeah. There are too many already. There's <laughs> Lightning wallets. There, I have like an, a map on my iPhone with the Lightning Wallet apps, and it's like two pages of apps. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. you know, uh, building and building. Yeah. Uh, okay, awesome. Um, have you also thought about some like uh, looping in or looping out? Uh, well, thanks to you. Uh, <laughs> so we were discussing this this whole Lightning scheme in there last week, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in Transylvania, CryptoCon. Yeah. And so then Max came up with the awesome idea that whenever I close a channel with one of my customers and um, well, I close it because it ran out of capacity, right? All the balance is now on the customer side. So it has to be closed anyways. So instead of closing it and opening a new channel, we should do that in one Bitcoin transaction because otherwise we're like, yeah, we're overpaying like too much fees. Yep. So yeah, splicing in more funds. Yeah, you fantastic. Uh, so, so like that's the cool thing with the UTXO model, right? You you close the channel in the input, and usually right now you would just create a single pub key output for yourself, and then in the next transaction you spend that single pub key and open the channel. But why not remove that middle step, right? Yeah, yeah. Why not close the channel in the input and open the channel in the output? Yeah, exactly. So, uh, the. One of the good things about that is that the UTXO set doesn't, uh, like you, wait, I have to say this differently. So in my method, as it is today with opening and closing the channels, that's two transactions per time, right? Mm -hmm. So that's two transactions in the blockchain that take up space. Now from those two, we could make one. That's already a good improvement. But what's really cool is that um, the UTXO set for that particular customer doesn't grow. Mm -hmm. So like whenever uh, we use the output, it's immediately an input. So then we were clean, we're cleaning up like the UTXO set constantly. Yeah. So that's, yeah. that's the best part. Yeah, exactly. And, and also is you don't have to stop routing. You can continue routing a payment uh, like through the Lightning Network because you only have inputs, like it, you, you close and open the channel atomically, right? So the channel is never closed. It's yeah. always open. So you can continue routing payments without any second to stop. Yeah. Wow. I only see benefits. Like I, well, if somebody else uh, 
maybe has some downsides to this, please let me know. But break otherwise, it. yeah, break it. <laughs> otherwise, I think, yeah, that's the way forward. Yeah, ah, hopefully. Let's see. Let's see. Yeah, cool. Awesome stuff. Um, what else are you tinkering on? What else? Oh, right. oh the nodal, the nodal integration. How did that work for the first? Oh yeah, so that's that's pretty cool because, like, for at least in the Lightning set, setup that we have right now, um, the node has to be online. Well, which nodes do we for sure know that are going to be online? Those are the nodal customers, right? Mm -hmm. The nodal users. They can, why would they ever shut them down? Yeah. Like that. That's only, I don't know, in a power outage event or so. So, so that's really cool. And uh, I was talking to the guys from Noddle in San Francisco for like during Bitcoin 2019. And we were like, yeah, we should work together. Like I can, this could work out. And so uh, what they have built in the last few days is like on their, you know, the, their, their dashboard. Dashboard, yeah. Man, that's, man. Um, they added a tile, which says like, uh, I don't know, bitter lightning or so. And what you can do there as an auto customer is enter your deposit code that you have with Bitter. And then your nodal talks to the Bitter server, which that's very nice of them. They explicitly mentioned like, hey, if you're doing this, you're gonna, your nodal is going to talk to the Get Bitter server. So be aware. Okay. Um, and then in the background, we'll uh, attach the public key of that LND node to, to your deposit code so that we know like, hey, this customer would want to receive funds in Lightning. Um, and then he receives the future payments on his nodal node directly yeah. over Lightning. And fully verified, fully self-sovereign. Oh, yes. Very perfect. Stacking stats on the nodal. Yeah. yeah. I like that tweet from Mr. Hoddle the other day. Like, um, buying Bitcoin is on-chain. Stacking stats should be off-chain. Or It was like something like this. And I was like, yeah. Yeah, it would make sense, right? And again, like with Bitter, it's just, you said it once, like do a SEPA like recurring payment every Monday couple like 25 50 euros worth that's it that's it Done. yeah that's fantastic and it, you know like the the time that it takes to do it manually is one thing but the discipline that's much harder because i was right. doing it myself manually like every saturday i would go on uh, this other exchange in holland to like, buy buy some bitcoin and at some point the price was going up and i was like oh no now it's too expensive yeah. and it's, it's stupid easy. like you should have just kept going because in hindsight it was it would have still been cheap yeah yeah so the recurring payments is the way to go and now especially who pay what's over lightning just <laughs> get better everyone <laughs> cool thanks for inviting me well yeah thank you very much for building this awesome tech uh, thank you for coming mm -hmm. on the show